Who thinks supply chain synchronization is an overused term in the industry? You have to show of hands. Do you think it's overused? No. Okay, good. Then it's a good presentation to be talking about. Um, I actually do think it's slightly overused because everybody uses it for everything in every tool solution that we see. Um, and that's confusing because then it becomes very generic and not very specific. At Procter & Gamble, we have a supply chain synchronization program that is very specific. And I'm going to take you through what we've done, what our synchronization strategy is, and some of the key insights that we've uh, explored along the way that really make a difference. Okay? Um, now, before I go into uh, a little bit about myself and about Procter & Gamble, um, I wanted to share with you why I'm talking about this this morning. So why would I, from Procter & Gamble, share our strategy on synchronization with, uh, with a lot of professionals? And there are two reasons. The first reason is that this is an end-to-end -end strategy. What does that mean? That means we need to partner with our retail partners, with our suppliers, but also with logistics partners along the supply chain to deliver this. We can't do it alone. So I'm very open to talk about this strategy because it's a joint strategy. So that's the selfish reason, let's say. The second reason is I think as professionals, we have a duty to drive losses out of the supply chain, make them more efficient, and this strategy does that. Why do we, I say we have a duty? Because that is important for sustainability as well. So for those two reasons, I think it's critical that we talk about this as an industry um, rather than keep our plans to ourselves. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've worked for Procter & Gamble for 20 years uh, in all parts of the supply chain. I've worked in manufacturing. I've worked in customer-facing roles and planning roles. Um, I am currently uh, the supply network operations leader for our oral care business in Europe. Um, but before I, I took that role, I created and led the program on synchronization, so driving the global synchronization strategy within PNG. So many of the examples I'll share with you today are from my experience in doing that. So let's talk about Procter & Gamble. I'm sure, well, I would expect most of you have heard of the name Procter & Gamble at least, um, but just to put us all on the same grounds, we're a $68 billion company um, worldwide. We have about 65 brands. Um, we always say about because we're always uh, either acquiring or divesting brands somewhere in the world. Uh, so we have about 65 brands, 10 portfolio categories. So I told you I'm, I work for oral care. Oral care is one of the 10 uh, categories. We have $20 billion brands. What does that mean? That means we have 20 brands with net revenue more than a billion dollars globally. Um, we sell in almost all countries in the world. Not quite all, but almost. And we operate in 70 countries, so truly an international company. We're here to talk about supply chain. So what does Procter & Gamble's supply chain look like? And when I talk about my previous role as the global supply chain synchronization leader, this is what I'm trying to synchronize. We have more than 130 manufacturing plants worldwide, 250 shipping locations, uh, shipping to our partners, um, more than 40 customization centers. Uh, within the product supply function, which includes everything on supply chain and manufacturing, we have 65,000 employees. Um, and 60,000 external partners. So key message here is it's huge, right? It's a huge operation uh, to, to think about synchronization. Um, so let's dive in to synchronization. So I said that for us in Procter & Gamble, synchronization is something very specific. We have a definition of what we, we say is synchronization. We say a synchronized supply chain is one that will source, produce, and ship daily what the consumers require and flow it seamlessly through the network. It's very simple. It's all about physical flow of materials through the supply chain. That's important because a lot of the time we talk about synchronization from um, digitization, data, tools, and capabilities. I'll talk about those later. They are huge enablers, but they are not synchronization itself. Synchronization is what physically happens in the operations. Okay? So I want to bring that a little bit to life for you. So this was the best way that I could visualize that concept. Um, this is how 
all our supply chains run today, right? Every part of the supply chain is operating a little bit differently, a different tack time, different frequency. This is the reality, right? So in a synchronized supply chain, we'd expect everything to be operating together. I know it's very idealized, right? <laughs> but that's the, uh, that's the concept that we're trying to get towards. Of course, this is ideal state. It's not saying that we actually have supply chains that operate like this, but in my experience of four years of driving this program, every step we make to get closer to this delivers big benefits. And it delivers benefits on three vectors. The first one is, it's kind of the obvious one, it, it helps with customer service. So it improves dramatically our service to customers. Simply every part of the supply chain is running at the tact of the, of the customer. Secondly, it drives out a lot of inventory in the supply chain. A lot of the reasons that we hold inventory in the supply chain is because of things being mismatched. So that helps from a cash point of view. And thirdly, it takes costs out of the supply chain by taking losses out. So there's three pretty compelling reasons as a, as a supply chain leader to want to go towards this direction. Now, what we learned over time with the program um, is there are a lot of different things that, that get us to here. It becomes very, very complex very quickly. So it's a very simple definition, but it's very complex to implement. Um, and we, we learned that there are, there are a number of things that we, uh, that we focused on. So first of all, we focused on agility. Um, secondly, we focused on the metrics. And thirdly, we focused on communication. So I'm going to come back to those three themes as we go through the presentation. So agility, measures, and um, communication. You're probably getting bored of the wheels going around, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's so difficult, because it's a, a, a very simple concept, but it's quite difficult. And I'm going to use an analogy for this. So you have to bear with me a minute, because we're going to get back to synchronization in a second. But my analogy is um, if you're at an airport <coughs> and uh, you've just flown in, you have lots of heavy baggage, and you need to get it off the baggage carousel. So you go down, maybe you're tired, maybe it's a long flight, maybe you have your family with you. You go down to the baggage carousel, and what do you want to do? You want to get your bags off first, right? So you rush up to the baggage carousel, just like in the photo, you get as close as you can to a good position. The bags are not coming out yet, I mean, the thing's not even going round, but you want to be there, ready, right? Yeah? The thing is, everybody else wants to be in the same place, so everybody crowds up to the baggage carousel. So what happens is, the bags start coming off, but you can't really see your bag because there's a guy next to you who's leaning forward trying to see his bag. And then you think it's your bag, but you realize it's somebody else's black Samsonite suitcase, right? So, so it's not that one. And when your bag finally comes, you want to swing it off the baggage carousel, but it's heavy and you're going to hit the guy next to you. And you don't really want to hit him because you're nice, but you do because you're annoyed he's in the way, <laughs> right? So you get your bag off, and it's all quite stressful, right? We've probably all been in the situation. If you just think about that situation, if everybody just took a step back, left a meter or two meters between them and the baggage carousel, you would be able to see your bag coming. You'd be able to step forward, take your bag off. The whole process would run much smoother. Right? Make sense? That is exactly why synchronization is difficult. Synchroniz synchronization is difficult because everybody in the supply chain is trying to optimize their part of the supply chain, and they don't look at the big picture. And even within a company like Procter & Gamble, the same company, I have people in a distribution center who have KPIs that they need to optimize their distribution center. I have people trying to optimize transport, fill trucks, minimize the number of uh, uh, trucks that are not full. I have people in the plant trying to optimize the capacity uh, usage of their site. And they're all trying to do their own thing. And nobody is looking at optimizing the big picture, right? So that's why it's like a baggage carousel on Saturday morning in Geneva when everybody's arriving for skiing. Good. So, like I said, in order to address this, we looked at three key things. And I keep going to come, come back to these three things. Agility and flow. How do we make things flow? The metrics that we used across and the communication and culture. So I'm going to talk about each of those three things and then I'm going to share a little bit my vision for the future. So let's talk about agility and flow. Um, Procter & Gamble is a fast-moving consumer goods company, right? So we 
produce and sell things like toothpaste, shampoo. These things are bought every day from the store. So when we talk about the, the rate of consumption, we talk about daily. We want everything to flow daily. It may be different in different industries. But that means that our shipments are often daily. So we need to be looking back from the shelf with our retail partners on how do we make sure that works daily. Um, and one of the things that I enjoyed very much about uh, the, running the program on synchronization was that I traveled around with a lot of our partners to also look at how we could cooperate together to improve our operations. And sometimes the most the, the operations which drive flow the best are not the ones that you would necessarily expect. So I visited a, a, a retail uh, partner in Mexico, um, a big retailer with a distribution center in the center of Mexico City. So you can imagine it's pretty big volume going through a, a, a distribution center in the, in the center of Mexico City. Um, and I, I visited many, many different uh, sites. This one actually blew me away by how well they manage flow. And what they did was incredibly simple. And it was very different than we operate most DCs in Europe. They had a very big distribution center. It was long and thin, and it had about 150 dock doors on, both, on each side. And it was a cross-dock operation, right? And I've seen a lot of different cross-dock operations. But their cross-dock operation worked like this. The trucks came in from the manufacturers and suppliers like us. They immediately depalletized the cases onto a conveyor where they were scanned. The conveyor ran down the whole length of this long uh, distribution center. And on the other side, each dock door was dedicated to a store. And basically, every case went straight down to one of those dock doors. And there was just a guy at the end of the conveyor. It was quite manual in some ways. There was a guy at the end of the conveyor. He was just taking the cases, manually building kind of rough uh, pallets, because they didn't use cages, and then putting them in the truck. When the truck was full, he closed the door, and it would go to the store. Of course, he was scanning them as he went, so the store knew what they were getting and so on. But it was a very simple operation. There was zero inventory, because everything that came in immediately went to this conveyor and immediately uh, flowed out to the stores. Um, and we started looking at this, and we thought, well, yeah, this is great, because everything is just flowing directly, and we can help then on, on our side. But there were still some legacy opportunities, right? So we were, um, one thing that they were asking us to do was book unloading slots on these 150 dock doors. So I was touring around and I said, OK, but how much of your business do we represent? Because we're, we're a big manufacturer. The answer was about 5%. OK, so about 5% of your dock doors would be about seven dock doors. I said, you give us two, no unloading bookings, we just turn trucks around. And we will flow into your system, and we can then bring the flow back. So sometimes, some of the things that can drive flow in the supply chain can be quite simple. So I talk a little bit about the, let's say, the, the, the retailer end of our supply chain. But what I really wanted to focus on was on manufacturing. Because manufacturing is really where we have the challenge on agility, I think. Um, and that's where we have the most focus on driving agility. It's quite easy if you've got enough volume to be flowing trucks every day. It's less easy to be producing the products every day that you need. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is that within Procter & Gamble, um, we have uh, a, a very strong history of manufacturing excellence. So we have a program driving operational excellence called Integrated Work Systems. We actually license this out to partners. So, um, so it's no secret. Uh, it drives, as, as many TPM processes do, um, you know, reduced stops, uh, more efficient changeovers, uh, and we have some of the most efficient manufacturing in the world. So we're very proud of that. But it's not enough. For synchronization, it's not enough. Um, because you, act, you exactly have the baggage carousel problem. You have the fact that we build all this, manu this capability, but we're not using it effectively to the benefit of the whole supply chain. Um, so what we needed was a way to bring the, what's needed from a supply chain point of view back to manufacturing. So as a supply chain leader, I needed to be able to tell my manufacturing partners exactly what do I need from them. And we came up with this very simple chart, 
um, which, is, which I'm going to explain, which tells us what's needed from manufacturing. So what do you see on this chart? The horizontal axis is the average daily shipments. The vertical axis is the coefficient of variation of shipments. So uh, the volatility, basically, how, uh, how noisy the signal is. And every black dot is an SKU, a stock keeping unit, a product, right? Now, we did these, and I, can't, I just pulled this example out. I can't remember which, which one of our businesses this was from. But we did these for many, many, many different businesses, and they, all the dots follow the same pattern, more or less. A lot of scatter, but more or less a curve, and you can roughly fit a, a, a curve to it. Now, what we, uh, what we learned empirically was below a coefficient of variation of 1.5, for our supply chains, that was more or less stable demand. It's actually still quite noisy, but for, we could cope with it. So we treated that as uh, relatively stable demand. Above that, it's very unpredictable. So that was more or less our cutoff. Okay? So you can see I've split it into sections. The red section is high average uh, production volumes or shipments and stable. Okay? So we want to be producing those every day. The green are uh, low uh, volumes, but uh, still stable. So we want to be producing those on a repeating basis, like every twice a week or every week. And then this lot in blue is quite erratic. So that's where we need to be thinking about um, you know, produced order if we get enough visibility and we're, we're fast enough. Uh, if not, that's where we need to be uh, holding some inventory and protection. But let's focus on the red and the green, right? Because we can always fit this curve, we can look at the point where that more or less intersects this 1.5 level that we say is stable. And this point then tells us, from demand only, there's no constraints, what our minimum production quantity should be in the site. So in this example, it's 1,000. Right? So essentially, from a fairly simple uh, analysis, we can go back from just pure demand, how, on daily shipments per SKU, back to telling the manufacturing site what should be their minimum production quantity? And guess what? Every single manufacturing site I went to, their minimum production quantity was probably over here, right? And if I go further, I fall off the stage. Um, so, of course, this was a bit of a challenge to get there. But at the same time, it was a bit of a breakthrough, right? Because it changed the, the thinking. Um, and I want to share another example with you. Um, and this was a plant I visited quite a few years ago. Um, a fabric care plant, so making fabric softener, so uh, Lenore in the UK. Um, this was in the Americas, so it wasn't in Europe. But I visited the plant, and uh, I spent two days with the plant manager, the supply network leader, um, and one of the business planners, talking through what we needed to do on this business. Um, and we talked this, and then we visited the, the, the packing lines. Um, and I've never worked in the fabric care business uh, in terms of a line, uh, line role, so this was kind of new to me. But our fabric care business is, uh, is very advanced. Um, and the department manager who ran the operations toured me around. And uh, so I said, I mean, what do you think my first question to the department manager running the packing operations is in this context? It's, it's what is your, exactly, what is your minimum production run length? And do you know what he said? Very proudly, he said six hours. Okay, so what's the natural follow-up question is, why is it six hours? Um, he said, well, we did a bit of an internal workshop, and we looked at a load of data, and we decided six hours was the best time, the most efficient time for our, uh, our operations. Uh, okay, that wasn't really what I was pushing at, so I tried to help him a bit, and I said, you know, this, it's a liquid filling operation, so is it dictated by the batch size? Um, of your making, because I used to work in hair care and we had 12-ton making systems and you had, you had to fill it all, right? No, no, he said, we have continuous liquid processing, right? So it's not a constraint. I can produce whatever length uh, I want. Great. Fantastic. Good job, fabric care. I said, um, all right, so I'm trying to help him out here. So uh, is it uh, driven by the changeover time? So does it take a long time to change this packing line from one to the other? He said, no, no, we've done rapid changeover. We can do it in, in five minutes. Okay, that's really good. Um, is, it, is it to do with the packing uh, materials, you know, the volume of the packing? No, no, no. I mean, they, like one pallet is 15 minutes run. It's not, a, it's not a factor. 
So I'm, I'm struggling now. So I said, okay, is it, is it to do with capacity, right? Are you absolutely maxed out on capacity and you need every capacity? He said, no, 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 we're staffed for three lines, but you see we're only running two of them. So I'm like, okay, let's, let's go back to the room. <laughs> and, um, and we basically put, and it's not this data, uh, but on the same chart, we put every product and we said, right, everything in the red box, we produce every day, right? Everything in the green box, we do twice a week or once a week. And we'd set, we changed all the parameters in the system. We set it all up there and then in a couple of hours. And like I said, this was in the Americas. I'm based here in Europe. So I left and I flew home and I didn't hear anything, which is always worrying because normally when people move to implementation, they have lots of questions and nobody had any questions. I didn't hear anything until about three weeks later. And what I hadn't realized um, was that one of the challenges they had was they had a lot of inventory um, because of their running six hour lens and whatever. They had a lot of excess inventory and they were paying for external warehouses to store this, this inventory. So three weeks later, I got an email that said, hey, our service has improved thanks to what we changed. Okay, good. Uh, it was already quite good, but it had already improved. Um, and here are the pictures of the empty external warehouses that we now don't need to uh, have. And we saved a six mega, six figure sum every year based on that one intervention. The capability that was there, the manufacturing had created, but we weren't using it correctly. Okay? So that's a little bit the power of really understanding from the demand in a simple way what you need from the supply chain. I wish every visit was so simple. Most of the places I went to, they really did have constraints, and we had to work through how we got through the constraints. But um, luckily in that one, it wasn't. Um, now, I said, uh, last two and a half years, I've been running the oral care supply chain. Uh, so oral care, we make uh, everything, manual brushes, uh, rinse, toothpaste. But the biggest business we have is the power toothbrush business, the oral B power toothbrushes. Um, so of course, I've applied exactly this to my own operations. Um, and for the power toothbrushes that, uh, that you see all the place, probably most of you use power toothbrushes and statistically more than half of you will be using our power toothbrush. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, the power toothbrushes that we pack now, um, we have a minimum production quantity of one pallet, which for some of the products is 162 items. That's how low I can go in the packing quantity that I run. And I don't go lower because it doesn't make sense to go lower than the pallet because that's the useful quantity to be sending down the supply chain. But that's, that's how my packing operations run. Um, the other thing that's relevant here is that we move to a 24-hour uh, planning time fence. So we, we plan only, uh, we plan today what's needed the day after tomorrow. And actually, we can go shorter if we want. And that means that some of this stuff, which we kind of talk as needed, we can put onto the line very, very fast if we need to. Okay, enough on agility and... Um, and, uh, and flow. I said I'd also talk about metrics. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways I want to bridge this is we were just talking about manufacturing and how often we produce something. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar, probably are, with the days before next run metric. It's a standard manufacturing metric to see how often we run <coughs> any given product on the line. So from the work we did on agility, you imagine days before next run, DBNR, is a critical metric for us. Um, I, I'm going to introduce this with another example. It's an example from a plant here in the UK. Uh, unfortunately, one we don't have anymore because it was divested. Um, but amazing plant. Really drove incredible, incredible work on agility. Um, and they were, they were doing phenomenal things. I, I used to visit them, and I would learn more from them than they would learn from me, which was good. Um, but I went there one time, and they'd, they'd driven many of these products to being run daily. But they had some issues. And so we sat down together, and we started looking at what was causing the, the, the challenges. And what we realized is that they were producing some of the SKUs that they were put on to daily production that had high volume. They were shipping uh, from here, from the UK, to Spain. And they were going by short, short sea shipment, by boat. And the boat was going once a week, right? Now, that's, they're producing it every day, but it's only shipping once a week. That's pretty stupid, right? <laughs> and it's pretty obviously that it's stupid once you have the data together. But again, you know, this silo is, thing gets in the way of us a lot in, in supply chain. So 
As soon as we knew that, the answer is simple. OK, don't produce those every day. Just produce them once a week in time to put them on the boat. Right? That's, that's about as simple as it can get. But what we realized was that these things are not obvious. And sometimes you have it that way around, but most of the time you have it the other way around. You're producing it once every three weeks, and it should be going every, uh, every day. So we realized that days before next run that we use in manufacturing applies equally everywhere else in the supply chain. So in that example, my days before next run in the plant was one day. But my days before next outbound, let's say, was seven. So the two are not matched, not very synchronized. So we came up, and that's what the top, uh, and, and you're deliberately not supposed to read it, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's, what the, that's what the top image is, is what we call our DBNX dashboard, right? And basically, what we look at is, uh, for example, materials coming into our plant. We look at days before next delivery of a given material, and we compare that to days before next consumption of the same material. And basically, every, every chart there is comparing for a given uh, operation, what, what the, how the two compare. And where there's a difference, a big difference, that's where we have opportunities on synchronization. So again, something quite uh, simple conceptually. <coughs> to get the data down to product level, uh, blow out all the bills and materials, it was not straightforward. But it allowed us to really understand up and down the supply chain what we need to do right to be able to synchronize with the next part of the supply chain. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I developed as part of the program, which is kind of the, the bottom two charts, was a measure called percentage synchronization. And basically, we can do this work on DBNX to balance and, and, and match. But if we don't know what actually the materials are flowing, then we don't know really how well synchronized. So we could still have quite matched you know, uh, inbound and outbound on this measure, but we might have four or five weeks of inventory sitting in between. So we're really not flowing as per the definition. So this percentage synchronization measure was a true measure of flow. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the definition in terms of how we calculated it. Uh, that will remain a secret. But it was essentially looking at every node in the supply chain, what came in, what came out, and making sure that everything kept moving through the supply chain. So that was important to have some metrics that help people see the big picture up and down the supply chain. Um, but I said, so I've talked agility and flow. I've talked um, the metrics and the analytics. I said I'd also talk about communication and culture. So I actually think that was one of the biggest things that was successful about this program and continues to be successful. Um, when I started it, um, I didn't have a big team or a big organization. There wasn't a huge center of excellence uh, in Procter & Gamble called supply chain synchronization. Um, there was just me. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who were very passionate, uh, but also had operational jobs. Um, so one of the things I did, and it sounds too simple almost, but every month put out uh, a newsletter to all the, all the product supply managers. You recall uh, 65,000 people overall, um, but to about 5,000 people we sent out a newsletter of what we're doing. And it wasn't ivory tower, top down, here's the strategy, go and follow. It was really a, here are examples, like the examples I've been sharing. Here's what worked. Here's what this person did. Here's what they did in China. Here's what they did here in uh, um, Nigeria uh, in order to drive better synchronization. And we built the program bottom up. We built it by a kind of viral movement, <coughs> by working with different operations, understanding what worked and basically building together the whole strategy as a big jigsaw from what worked well. Um, and that made it all the more powerful because it got a lot of pull from the organization. Now, the one thing I wanted to share, and I only realized this with hindsight, so after, whatever, three to four years of sending these out every month religiously, I only realized with hindsight what the couple of ingredients that made them so powerful was. The first one was they were all examples, but the most important thing um, well, they're all examples, and they're all digestible. So I made sure that nothing was more than 150 words. I told people they could link to whatever they wanted, videos, uh, PowerPoints, 10-page uh, documents. But what actually went in the newsletter was 150 words. Um, but I, I made sure that it was understandable to everybody. So remember the baggage carousel problem, right? Part of the problem that we don't communicate very well is that we don't talk the same language. Even within our company, 
the acronyms that we use on the people who are working logistics, customer facing, so we call them customer team logistics leaders, CTLLs, are using very different terminology and acronyms than people in manufacturing, than people in transportation. And I'm sure all companies have this problem, but I'm sure we're probably the worst in terms of using acronyms and jargon in how we speak about our area. The problem with that is it's domain knowledge, and you're only talking to people who already understand your area. So what we did, and I was absolutely OCD about this, <laughs> I made sure that in every newsletter there was not a single acronym and there was no jargon. And I made people rewrite things multiple times until it was understandable in plain English. And why was that so important? That was so important so that the guy working the customer team could understand what the purchasing guy is talking about and the <coughs> purchasing guy could understand what the manufacturing guy could talk about. It's simple, but very, very powerful when it's done at scale. Um, so... That's, they're the three things that I pulled out that I wanted to talk about this morning in this keynote, but I wanted to pull it all together a little bit with another example um, of something that we did uh, practically. So let me just talk through this example, um, and then I'll share a little bit my thoughts on supply chain of the future. So this example is we have a, we have a plant in Italy, and the plant in Italy is producing for, for Europe, but it also has a small volume that goes to Morocco, right? Okay. So we were shipping uh, from Italy uh, to Morocco by boat uh, every month. So how did this supply chain work? Um, in the plant in Italy, once a month, they produce everything that they need to produce for Morocco. They'd fill it straight into the containers as it came off the production lines. Those containers would go on the boat, and they would arrive in the port in Morocco. What was the problem in Morocco? The problem was that the service to our customers was terrible. Um, the inventory was very high, and we had a lot of costs for demurrage and expedite fees in the port. So what was happening? One of the big challenges here was that actually clearing the containers through customs was the bottleneck in this supply chain. Right? So we were getting about one container per day uh, through. Now, what was happening was we were going out of stock in a, in a particular product, or SKU, um, in Morocco, and then they would need that, that product. And that product would be in a container somewhere in the port, but it wouldn't be the next container or the next one. It would be one somewhere at the back that then had to be expedited, right? And this was just an ongoing pain that they, uh, the team dealt with. Um, so what did we do? We looked at this whole supply chain. We got all the people together from up and down the supply chain and said, take the synchronization concept and look at the flow. So the first thing was, we were sending a boat, containers on a boat once a month. Well, the boat from Italy to Morocco actually went every week. So the first thing is, can we put containers on it every week? Yes, we had sufficient volume to have a number of containers every week. We didn't need to be sending such a big amount once a month. So that's the first easy win, is move it to, uh, to weekly. But then we had to go and look at OK, well, what are we doing in, in, in Italy? Because we need to solve the problem of the, of the port congestion. Right? It sounds a bit weird to do that in Italy. But what we did was we said, OK, once a week, you produce everything from Morocco. And instead of putting the first production run that you do into the first container and the next one into the next container, you put a few pallets of each. Remember the SKUs in the red box? You put a few pallets in each container of the high volume SKUs. So product A, product B, product C, whatever, is in every container. Of course, the kind of as-needed SKUs you put wherever you want when you get to the low volume. But the high volume stuff, every container would have more or less the same uh, ratio of high volume SKUs. It created a bit more work for the plant. But of course, by the time the containers arrived in Morocco, as they cleared through customs, the inventory levels were all brought up at the same time, rather than a big slug of one and then that going down. So we put, this, uh, we put this intervention in place, and it wasn't difficult. To, uh, it just required a bit of staging and a bit of manipulation in, in uh, Italy. Um, and we, we brought the service. So the service was a disaster. We brought it back to Target. That was, uh, that was relatively straightforward with that. We halved the inventory that we were holding in the market in order to do that, um, literally halved. Um, and we took... Um, 
almost one dollar per case out of the transportation costs because of uh, the merge and expedite fees we no longer needed to pay. So this is huge benefit. So I told you at the beginning, so service, inventory, and, uh, um, and cost. This is a good example where we drove all three. <coughs> Okay, so I wanted to talk um, a little bit before I close about how I see the future um, based on the work that we've done on this synchronization program. Um, and I think, the f I, I honestly believe there hasn't been a better time to be a supply chain professional. It's an amazing time. There is so much that is changing in terms of how we run the supply chains and so much technology that we can harness to do things very differently than we have done uh, before. And I think there are three key areas that are changing that are going to have a big impact on how supply chains look like in the future. The first one is affordable automation. Um, and I'm really talking about physical automa automation. Uh, in the picture, you see uh, collaborative robots on, uh, on the packing line. Um, these are cheap. I mean, 20 years ago when I started, uh, a manufacturing robot cost millions and was, uh, had to be a high volume line that was doing one thing very dedicated. Now, we're able to have uh, relatively cheaply for a few tens of thousands, uh, robots that can work alongside people and can do things uh, in a, and can be programmed very, very easily. So this affordable automation uh, basically means uh, we can, we can uh, change our thinking. Um, another example of this is uh, automatic guided vehicles. Um, again, when I started, you had AGV solutions that were very expensive. Now, uh, a driverless forklift truck <coughs> is getting close to the price of an ordinary forklift truck, right? <laughs> so automation is, uh, is becoming all-encompassing. The second kind of vector that I see changing is, of course, data, right? Data processing, the speed we're able to manipulate data, um, and how we're able to use data uh, within our supply chain. Um, my planning organization for the Oracare business is about uh, 100 people. Um, and the average seniority in my planning team is nine months. And these guys are amazing. They're absolutely amazing. So we, we teach them how to do the planning. <laughs> Uh, they're doing everything from demand planning, um, production planning, materials planning, replenishment uh, planning. Um, so we teach them how to do the planning, but we give them the analytics and tools. So we give them the capability to create their own analytics dashboards. Uh, we give them uh, tools like, uh, like, like Rulex, um, you know, RPA, robotic process automation tools. Um, and we say, hey, look, this is how it's been done, but if you can do it better, here are the tool here's the toolkit. Um, and within the last year, I mean, the pull on those capabilities has just been phenomenal. Uh, every time we have an area that we're struggling, then uh, one of the planners comes up with a new dashboard in terms of how we can see the data together. Um, about, uh, from our distribution um, requirements planning, about 80% of the deployments are now done fully automatically by capability they, they design themselves. And their role is now looking at uh, how this operates and optimizing the logic rather than manually doing the planning. Um, likewise, touchless forecasting and so on. So I think the way that we both bring data to the people, democratize the data, but the ability to leverage large amounts of data and really do something useful with it uh, is, uh, is getting to a point. It's not new, but I, uh, what I see in my organization is it's got to the point where it's in the hands of the people. It's truly in the hands of the people. And the third one I put here is the trend towards more complexity. So the external trend of more personalization, people want different things, different products. And certainly work, part of my business being in appliances, so power toothbrushes, I see uh, that we need all sorts of different variants for different channels and different uh, uh, types of customers uh, and consumers. And I don't think this is going to change. I, I constantly have debates with my salespeople on why they really need something, but. Uh, that's an ongoing argument because some of the complexity is not good. But in the last two years, uh, in my business, we've increased the, the, the SKU count by 40%. Maybe it's too much, but it's not going to decrease. It's, it's going to keep going up. 
Now, you put these three different trends together, and I, I see a very different future to supply chain. I don't think the name of the game is in scale anymore. I don't think the name of the game is in big scale manufacturing that's highly automated and, and, and highly manual. I think, particularly with the affordable automation, we can do small scale cheaply, efficiently, um, because the reason that that scale play was so big, let's face it, was a lot was labor arbitrage. Um, and and, and uh, that goes away when you start bringing a lot of automation into the operations. So I see a future where supply chain will be more distributed, um, you know, where we'll have more uh, lower speed, uh, lower volume, but highly agile uh, capability. Um, and, and we've looked at this, and when you run the sums, it's quite interesting because the lines are also a lot cheaper. So you can put 10 low-speed lines that can produce the same volume as, say, one high-speed line for the same capital. And if you can automate most of the operations, then you can also be, get close from a, from a labor point of view. And uh, the agility you have is, uh, is breakthrough. So I really believe that that's, that's what the future of the supply chain will look like. Low speed, highly agile supply chains with a lot of automation. Um, so I want to just summarize a little bit uh, what I've talked. So I, um, I talked about synchronization being really fundamental. Uh, we get confused uh, in talking about all sorts of complex things, which are capabilities that help. But synchronization at its heart is a simple definition. We want to source, produce, and ship daily what the consumers require and flow it seamlessly through the network. Okay, so we in Procter & Gamble, we think about the, the wheels. We think about uh, making sure each part of the supply chain is set up to, to match the, the next one. I, I summarized the key things. I mean, I could talk all day in terms of what we did, but I summarized the key things that we, uh, that we drove uh, within Procter & Gamble as uh, agility in all parts of the supply chain, but particularly manufacturing agility is key to making sure we can deliver that. Having metrics that really help people understand up and down the supply chain, what works and what doesn't, and um, making sure you build the right culture. So in my mind, bottom-up viral culture will be much more powerful to really change how an organization thinks about how its supply chain works. Um, so that really, for me, is supply chain synchronization. So I hope I've unpacked supply chain synchronization a little bit for you. My name has been John Chambers. Thank you very much. <laughs>